is good to worship with you all this morning. I, I just can't tell you how um, overjoyed I have been over the last couple of weeks coming here and, and, and sitting up front and just hearing you who are gathered worship God. Um, I don't know if there's anything more beautiful than getting to experience that as a pastor. And so I'm very thankful. And so welcome to everyone who is here and who is tuning in online as well. For those of you who are new, my name is Pastor Brendan. Uh, and welcome to Jefferson Baptist Church and worship here. So this morning, if you have your devices or your personal Bibles, would you please turn to Luke? We're going to continue on and we're going to be in the next passage, which is Luke chapter 11, verses 14 through 23. And as you turn there, keep in mind that uh, since the beginnings of the Gospel of Luke, we have been seeking to know one thing, and that is certainty concerning the Gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, our previous series really should have convinced us all the more of this certainty that Jesus is who He says He is, because um, there's no man who could have known the mind of God and taught with such precision how we ought to approach Him in prayer. And he taught us not only how to approach him, but how to grow in that discipline as his own disciples uh, to become greater and greater in our walk of becoming children of God and seeking his mind on things that we should be praying for. And now our passage today and over the next few weeks is going to switch gears a little bit here. We're not going to be focusing anymore on prayer, but... Uh, rather, Luke moves us on in the journey of Jesus' ministry and brings us in the rest of chapter 11 to uh, confrontations that Jesus has with the Pharisees and other teachers of the law. And Jesus and the teachers of the law are duking it out, so to speak, a little bit here. And so uh, what we'll find is that really our often misguided picture of Jesus being this calm, gentle, and entirely peaceful fellow, um, or just teacher in general, is really replaced with a Jesus that is powerful and authoritative in his task of bringing God's kingdom into this world. And in fact, it becomes very clear as Jesus is in confrontation with these leaders that they are really Jesus' enemies. So... This is God's word to us this morning from Luke chapter 14 uh, through 23. Luke chapter 11, verses 14 through 23. And as I read, I just want to remind us that God is present with us this morning. Amen. And His word is not simply just words written and me reading. It is actually God speaking to you through the scriptures. And so as we listen... Hear your God this morning speak to you in Jefferson Baptist Church. And so, Luke chapter 11, verses 14 through 23. Now he was casting out a demon that was mute. When the demon had gone out, the mute man spoke, and the people marveled. But some of them said, He casts out demons by Beelzebul, prince of demons. While others, to test him, kept seeking from him a sign from heaven. But he, knowing their thoughts, said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and a divided household falls. And if Satan also is divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? For you say that I cast out demons by Beelzebul, and if I cast out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore they will be you are judges. But if it is by the finger of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. When a strong man, fully armed, guards his own palace, his goods are safe. But when one stronger than he attacks him and overcomes him, he takes away his armor in which he trusted and divides his spoil. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. This is God's word to us this morning. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, 
you are here and you are present in our midst. And so we seek to come to you and worship you as best we can through Christ, who empowers us through the Holy Spirit. So, Lord, I ask that you would open our hearts, open our minds, so that we might be able to hear you speaking to us as if you were speaking, as if we were speaking to a friend. Lord, give me grace now as I seek to preach your word and help guide us as a people. Lord, it is your glory that we seek. And so help us to accomplish that in Jesus' name. Amen. So as all of you are aware, or all of you know, uh, the board and myself collaborated on making the transition back to in-person worship as smooth and safe as possible. And at first we had two services, one with optional masks and then the other which masks were required at. And then we did this in many ways to really use it as a trial to see what we would do as a leadership next. Um, and the overwhelming majority of the congregation came to the optional mask service. Uh, so the board and I made the final decision to return to one service where masks were recommended, but optional. We made this decision um, really with heavy hearts, uh, realizing that we could not accommodate everyone's preferences regarding the sensitive matter. Uh, and I am extremely pleased with the board and how they've worked and how we work together to give people more options than a lot of churches uh, have given on returning to worship, um, just as we see the different sections that we're trying to, to have for those who want masks and those who want otherwise. And I just want to acknowledge this morning that we have obviously fallen short of being perfect and loving and accommodating everyone as we would have liked. With that being said, uh, the nature of our text this morning has really required me to uh, tackle this issue for us as a church for various reasons and making, uh, for various reasons I've just chosen really not to address uh, the mask controversy as I'm going to call it. Uh, mainly because I believed and I still believe that it's a matter of individual conscience. Uh, but it is causing serious division among brothers and sisters in the church as, and as a whole, and even here in Jefferson Baptist Church. Uh, so my hope is not to condemn anyone, not to make anyone feel marginalized, uh, but that Christ's words that he is speaking to us will strike us all deep within our hearts convict us if we are having a spirit of disunity or speaking ill of our brothers and sisters who take a different opinion or uh, a different stance on the matters with regards to the mask. Most importantly, it is my desire to cause us all to gather again under the banner that should ultimately unite us, and that is Christ and Him crucified. And so this morning, I'm going to be looking at this text in a positive nature for us, calling us to gather to Jesus. We're going to be looking at who Jesus is in four different points here. So we're going to gather to Jesus first because He is our miracle worker. We've already heard that this morning from George. Uh, two, because He is our thought reader. Three, because He is our unity. And then four, because He is our defense. So we are to gather to Jesus because he is our miracle worker. Jesus and the disciples moved on from a certain place where they had approached him about teaching them to pray as John's disciples. And as we saw through our series, Jesus did just that. He taught his disciples to pray, teaching them that great discipline. And now Luke records that they are coming to another undesignated location. We don't know where this takes place. But as Jesus does often, as he was doing in this place, he's doing works, manifesting the kingdom of God as was his mission here on earth. And he did so by casting out a demon and giving the man his voice again and liberty from the spiritual oppression that he had been under. And as he did his work in that place, he was met with people being amazed at seeing this miracle and marveling, but he was also met with some animosity. We see this in verses 14 and 15. 
Now he was casting out a demon that was mute. When the demon had gone out, the mute man spoke, and the people marveled. But some of them said, He casts out demons by Beelzebul, the prince of demons. As we encounter Jesus and desire to gather to him today, there can ultimately be two camps. Just as we've seen throughout the Gospel of Luke, Jesus makes these two camps himself. And the first camp are those who will hear of Jesus' works, witness the power of his miraculous hand in their lives, and respond with amazement, awe, wonder, and in turn put their faith in him. Then there is the second camp, who will hear the same words, see the same miracles, but will reject Jesus as simply a mere man and not as the miracle worker that he truly is. So as we gather to Jesus this morning, let us soak in the power and awesome deeds of who Jesus is. In verse 14 again, now he was casting out a demon that was mute, and when the demon had gone out, the mute man spoke, and the people marveled. No mere man can cast out a demon by the words of his mouth. This God-man, Jesus, the God-man, came to give salvation to Israel and to us. He brought the personal presence of the infinite God into the life of us who are depraved and sinful, so that we might see, believe in Him, and glorify God for being merciful to mankind through His condescending to know us in our infirmities and give us through faith peace with God, whose wrath was against us. What miracles have you experienced through Jesus? Or, as we've seen, it is not a question that Jesus still does miracles through his people and through his church. Amen. But if you're hard up for an answer, the fact that you're able to hear and think and attempt to even answer the question is a miraculous gift to you from God this morning. Amen. Your life, from its very conception to the present moment is a miracle by the, by the almighty creator and sustainer of life. Have you ever considered the greatest miracle you have been given as a Christian? Truly ponder what it is to be saved by the God of the universe. Your rebirth. Your reanimation by the power of the Holy Spirit to be a new and living creature, able now to grow in the knowledge of God and in true holiness as God Himself is holy. Jesus freed this man from the oppression of a demon that made him mute. And afterward, the man could not help but speak with his newfound voice. How much more should we then declare the wonderful and all-surpassing riches that we have been given through Jesus Christ, through the glorious work of our salvation that was conceived in the heart and mind of our loving God since before He spoke one single word of creation. Gather to Jesus this morning, for He is our miracle worker. And if you don't know the miracle of His salvation or you have for some time stood in the camp of opposition against Jesus, the only mediator and Savior between God and man. Turn to Him today. Repent of your sin and believe upon the name of Jesus for your salvation. We gather to Jesus because He is our miracle worker, but also because He is our thought reader. So we gather to Jesus because He is our thought reader. And we see this in Verses 16 and 17. While others, to test him, kept seeking from him a sign from heaven. But he, knowing their thoughts, said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and a divided household falls. Jesus was being derided by those who had rejected him. Some of them were so foolish that they were even asking him for a sign from heaven. As if casting out a demon from a man and allowing him to speak once again wasn't sign enough. But this is often the way of unbelief. We think that we need to see more, hear more, or experience something more than Jesus himself has revealed to us in God's word. 
He has been revealed to us as He is and as we need to know Him. And Christ knew the minds of those who were against Him. And He knows our own this morning. And his response is direct, and we are quite capable of understanding what he says in response to these unbelievers. His response again was this in verse 17. But he, knowing their thoughts, said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and a divided household falls. We currently live in a divided America. In so many different ways. And the main way is politically. And this political division is now influencing our hearts and minds to such a degree that it is creating enemies of those who should not be our enemies. Christians should not be enemies against other sound, orthodox, gospel-believing Christians. And I make a distinction because there must be a defining factor where we are able to part ways with others who claim the name of Christ, but are not truly His. And it is the biblical Jesus to whom we are seeking to gather ourselves this morning, and believe in Him that we make our stand upon. If people reject Him, they reject us. And we should be comfortable and even rejoice in that. Amen. Now with that being said, we must take heed this morning that we do not look like the godless culture in its hostility against the church, demanding churches to close because of the virus. If a church is gathering to worship the true and living God of the Bible, even if we stand in on a different political or personal opinion about how that should look, we should never look down upon them bringing glory to God by gathering for worship as they see the Scriptures commanding them to do. That would contradict our very nature and purpose as Christians and members of Christ's body, the church. We should be willing to speak well of our brothers and sisters, no matter how they are gathering to worship. A kingdom divided cannot stand. And the picture Jesus gives as he mentions this kingdom and house is a house literally falling down upon another house, wreaking destruction and havoc. Jesus knows our hearts and minds and sees directly into the way we have been thinking and speaking about the church. Not just the whole church, but Jefferson Baptist Church. And he does so because he is who was prophesied by Simeon to Mary and Joseph early on in Luke chapter 2. You read this, Luke 2, 34-35. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel, and for a sign that is opposed. And a sword will pierce through your own soul also, so that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. So this morning as we seek to gather, let us not be the house falling down to deal devastation and division upon other members and bodies of Christ. Rather, let us gather to Jesus, who is our miracle worker, our thought reader, and our unity. So we gather to Jesus this morning because He is our unity. We see that Christ is our unity from the response He gave those who were deriding Him, suggesting that He was this prince of demons. We already read chapter, or verse 17, but... The whole response is from 17 through 20, so I'll read that. But he, knowing their thoughts, said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and a divided household falls. And if Satan also is divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? For you say that I cast out demons by Beelzebul. And if I cast out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore they will be your judges. But if it is by the finger of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Jesus' response is one of great logical sense. What group of people have you ever worked with that accomplished anything if there is backbiting or infighting going on within the midst of them? Like every 
group project in school or in college where you have one person who is the go-getter and then all of the other people who whine about how they are overachievers. That doesn't help get a better grade on your group project. But Christ points out the reality that Satan and his hordes of hell, the fallen angels in rebellion against God, have a logical enough mind or practical enough way of thinking that leads them to be unified. Their pursuit of bringing down the kingdom of God is, is all they think about. They are unified on that matter. And Jesus made it abundantly clear to those in his hearing that if they said he was the one who had the demon, then by nature they would have to be saying their own exorcists were casting out demons by the spirit of the demonic. They were contradicting themselves. Their own sons would be the judges of their foolishness. And in their delusional state of hatred against Jesus, they could not see that the kingdom of God had come upon them by Jesus' power and authority to speak and get the demons to leave those who they were oppressing. And the reference Jesus makes to him being the finger of God is directly related to the powerful presence of God crashing into the world of sinful man. Just like when Moses received the tablets of the righteous law written by the finger of God, so it is Christ who is the kingdom of God and our righteousness as the final standard of salvation and perfection for all people. And it is Christ's finger through the Holy Spirit that writes that perfect law upon our hearts to know what is of faith and what is of sin. And if we allow a spirit of division or strife to rule in our own hearts, it will seek to rule in Christ's church. If this attitude or disposition is our stance, then we are being duped by the demons and their master, Satan himself. And we are missing the ability to offer the finger of God through our own witness as the church to this world in desperate need of hope and salvation unto eternal life by proclaiming the gospel of Jesus and worshiping our God. Do you recognize, church, that when we gather here, we are the finger of God, manifesting God to the world? Amen. The mass controversy has become a clear foothold for the earthly and demonic influence upon the whole church, not only in our country, but everywhere. And Jefferson Baptist has not escaped Satan's grip here. We would rather talk negatively about how a church has no mass to worship than praise God, that there are still churches who are worshiping God faithfully in the midst of this. And the same goes for others who hold the opposite view. We would rather hate on churches that are wearing all masks or changing up their traditional style of worship gatherings because they are faithless or something like that. This ought not to be so. And I personally have had to ask the Lord for forgiveness for my own attitude over some of these things, not only just to the Lord, but also to other people. And I continue to ask that you give me and the leadership grace to know what is the best course of action for Jefferson Baptist Church. We are all new to loving each other in the midst of a pandemic. <laughs> but whether the coming decisions we make as a board is that everyone are to wear masks or that we leave it up to individuals as we have done, I truly believe that we need to be very strongly considering, as believers in Jesus, returning to the physical gathering of the saints if our circumstances allow. Because it's in our physical togetherness in Jesus that we are brought together, <coughs> strengthened, encouraged, and continued to be unified through the presence of the Holy Spirit. The writers of Hebrews was speaking to this exact thing when he said this in Hebrews 10, verses 24 through 25. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more <coughs> as you see the day drawing near. That is when Christ returns, and He is coming. Each of us gathered here today, whether online or here in the sanctuary, have unique circumstances. 
For some of you, you are caring for an at-risk family member or you yourself have compromised health. And there are other circumstances as well that are going on in your lives that we might not know. There is no one-size-fits-all answer to these conundrums that we face. So in our inability to find certainty in our circumstances, let us rest with ever-growing peace upon the one person we know that is certain in every outcome and knows every outcome, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The one through whom the kingdom of God has been brought to us in power and authority and through whom we are unified with an eternal unity that transcends this world. So let us gather to Jesus because He is our miracle worker. He is our thought reader, our unity, and finally, our defense. Jesus concluded His statement to His accusers with these words in verse 21 through 23. When a strong man, fully armed, guards his own palace, his goods are safe. But when one stronger than he attacks him and overcomes him, he takes away his armor in which... He trusted and divides his spoil. Whoever is not with me is against me. And whoever does not gather with me scatters. In this example or illustration, Jesus is recognizing that Satan is a fully armored adversary. Satan is ready for war. And he guards the goods of his kingdom of darkness. And just as Jesus points out here, we need to keep in mind that Satan is a strong man who deceptively guards his kingdom as he goes to and fro about the earth seeking whom he might devour. And as long as he can maintain a spirit of disunity among Christ's body, we are allowing him to maintain his armor. And believe me, he is far more cunning and slimy in his deceit than we often give him credit for. Let us be diligent. He will guard his strongholds of stealing, killing, and destroying, and division as long as he is able. But Jesus continues his illustration, suggesting that there is someone stronger than Satan. Jesus is stronger than Satan. And his kingdom of light, the kingdom of God, overpowers our enemy, Satan. Jesus stands victorious over him. And we, as his brothers and sisters, receive the benefits of that victory. The spoils of salvation, redemption, forgiveness, reconciliation, and the promise of eternal life by the Spirit that resides within us. And this is where the sermon I am preaching to you came from. The concluding statement that Jesus gives here. As he sums everything he has set up. He says this. Whoever is not with me is against me. And whoever does not gather with me scatters. Gather to Jesus. Gather to Jesus because if you do not, you are as, one, as a one man army. Standing against the tides of the demonic. The army of Satan. And the great dragon of old will consume you. And you will become a morsel fueling his fight against Jesus and the kingdom of God. Gather to Jesus because as you do, you will receive grace and peace and confidence. You will be comforted knowing that you stand surrounded by the king of heaven, the general of the armies of heaven, and the thousands upon thousands of angels he commands to fight alongside us. Gather to Jesus because he is our defense. Him and Him alone. Gather to Jesus so you are not fight, found fighting against Him. Gather to Jesus so you will not be scattered. Come together. Be unified in Him. My hope, my prayer, is that we would not allow any form of division or strife to take hold or to continue in any way among us here at Jefferson Baptist Church. 